Hello, thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. I've said this kind of thing before, but I thought it's worth repeating because of something I just read the other day. And that is, when you talk to people who are non-believers, if uh, you talk... Well, I mean, the average person, the average Christian talks to non-believers, but not always about skepticism, not always about worldviews, not always about Christianity or atheism and so forth. But some people who listen to my podcast, or several, do. They do talk to others about their faith, and others who are not even trained in the field try to talk to people who are non-believers. And I applaud that. I think that's wonderful. Obviously, everybody who's a Christian is not trained to do that. I do, I've said, <laughs> I do believe, and I've said many different ways, many different times, how important it is for Christians to have something to say beyond, I don't know, you know, <laughs> why are you a Christian? Uh, we want to have something to say. But the, my, my reflection today is mainly about uh, being prepared again for people who are non-believers when they speak to believers very often, if, if it's a certain kind of non-believer, they speak very, very confidently. And I found in my experience several years ago, they used to scare me, used to intimidate me. So you have people like a Peter Atkins, Dr. Peter Atkins, who teaches at Oxford. I think he still teaches, he's maybe retired, but he talks just constantly. Christians are basically insane and stupid and backwoods, and they just it's just a matter of fact. But what I've found is every single time I've talked to an atheist, I've talked to very, very kind ones, gentle ones, hateful, rude punks, I, the whole gambit. And that's true for Christians. I've talked to kind Christians and punk Christians, and that's very sad, but that's true. When I've talked to atheists and dialogue with them from Twitter to YouTube to in person and on and on, something I've found overwhelmingly to be the case is that they just are ignorant. They don't know the field at all. And I'm making fun of them. Ignorant doesn't mean they're stupid. Ignorant means uninformed. That's all it means. I'm saying this because it's a matter of fact, but I'm really saying if you're a Christian to encourage you, you can easily be swayed by confidence, but not content. Confidence, but not content. I'm reminded just the other day, I was listening uh, to a discussion William Lane Craig, Bill Craig had, and he was having a discussion with, with an interlocutor who's an atheist, works the reporter for the New York Times. And the New York Times reporter asked him several questions. Craig answered them, but the reporter said, all right, I've been asking you all these questions and challenging you deeply or something, but they weren't challenging whatsoever, but they apparently are to an atheist. Now, what questions do you have for me? Or what, what would you love to have? Or something like, what, what would you love to take place? Or something, what do you want from me? I can't remember the exact words. And Craig said, I don't mean, I'm paraphrasing. I don't mean this in a mean way. But what I would love to have just once in my life is with an atheist who's informed. An informed conversation with an atheist. They just don't know. And what's amazing to me is how overwhelmingly confident they can be in their ignorance. It's one thing to be ignorant. It's another thing to be confident. But when you're a confident ignoramus... In my view, that's dangerous. Now, this works with any worldview, any person. I'm not just picking on atheists. It works with anybody. Uh, ignorant, uh, condescending, or arrogant Christians, which that's a... You are a baby Christian at best, if I, if that just fits you as your description. That's bad, too. But right now, I'm just focusing on talking to non-believers. The other day, I received uh, a blog from a New Testament scholar that I follow. His name is Larry Hurtado. I've had him on my podcast before. He's a great great scholar and so forth. And Larry's great. He also is quite blunt and I wouldn't always comment the way he does, but maybe sometimes I do as well, but I understand he gets worked up on his blog. Very often he'll, he says things are very informative. And then people in the comment section, it's very common for them to throw out all kinds of, well, you could say, you could say, I bet this is the case. You could say it's just full of well, just rambling nonsense from people who are very confident, especially from non-believers. Sometimes they're believers, and they just don't know what they're talking about. And it reminded me of that again. So here's a, uh, something at the time of this recording of the podcast. This the blog just came out, and I'm going to read chunks of this blog from Larry Hurtado to make the point how this is common and what he was saying, but also what I'm saying when it comes to atheism. And I'll come, I'll tie these together in a second. Uh, Larry Hurtado, Professor Hurtado says. Having spent a few decades investigating early Christian usage of the Codex and what was all entailed, the Codex, by the way, is what we call a book. It's a book form where there's a spine and the pages are folded, a common day book. That's a Codex. Anyway, he says, having investigated it for a few decades, 
including reading everything I could find written by other scholars about ancient books and examining examples of roles and codices for myself, I find it amusing and a bit annoying when individuals obviously totally new to the issues constantly offer, quote, simple answers to the questions about why early Christians preferred the Codex. Their proposals are what is properly referred to as spitballing, which in the Urban Dictionary is defined as, quote, to shoot ideas out in the open that may cause yourself to seem like a complete dunce. He continues, that's a bit harsh, but really, is there any other field of academic work in which rank amateurs, with none of the skills involved, none of the relevant training, and no proven competence in publishing in the subject so readily and so confidently launch their opinions? This also often involves disdain for the work of those scholars who actually have the necessary attributes to be taken seriously. So, for example, on the matter of early Christian preference for the Codex, it is not too much to ask those who haven't already done so to at least read some of the key scholarly studies on the matter before launching their own speculations. End quote. And he goes on and recommends his work and some other stuff. And then he says, uh, Please, it is rather tiresome to have spitball efforts to solve a complex and demanding issue. When I read that, I, I just went, oh my goodness, I could not concur more. In my experience with talking to non-believers, that is exactly the case. The other day I was having a conversation with a couple atheists, two different, two or three people at different times, meaning they weren't, they weren't on the same thread. They were atheists. And it was so obvious right off the bat, they didn't know anything about the field. So what I've, what I've done in the last couple of years of my life is what I do early on is I, uh, if I could tell the, the atheist is just uh, or non-believer, they might not be an atheist, but agnostic, whatever. Uh, if the non-believer seems open and not very rude and hateful, I'm, I will ask them if they want to have a conversation or I'll do my best to answer it. And I always try to try to be as gentle as I can. If it's obvious they're just rude and punks, or whatever, I don't waste my time. I, I just don't. I might say, thank you so much for your opinion, move on. But some people are just horribly, horribly crass and rude. And that's just the way it is in the world. But those that are seem a little interested, even if they're a little rude, but they seem a little interested, really they're asking more meaningful questions versus just name calling, whatever. I try to, uh, to dialogue with them. And certainly the ones who are actually very kind, I certainly want to talk with them as much as they want to, you know, I try to answer questions and all that kind of stuff as I talk about other podcasts. But just the other day when I was talking to two different pod, uh, atheists, it was very obvious that they were a little on the middle road to the kinder kind. And they mentioned some challenges, and it was the same confident assertions. Well, we know that didn't happen, or you can't trust the gospel because of their fiction, or whatever. What I do is, in the, I've told, talked about this many times, but Greg Kokel out of California was informative here for me, and he's right, that you don't always give a defense for it. You ask, why do you think that? Anybody who makes a claim, a truth proposition, you always demand that they, they back it up. So when someone says something like, we know God doesn't exist, or we know the Gospels can't be trusted. You are not, in my view, you're not supposed to come on the defensive, go on the defensive, and say, uh-huh, here's why. The first thing you should do is pause and listen and take it seriously, and then you go, okay, well, why do you think that? What's your evidence for that? Now, what I've been doing the last few years is adding another component. I go, oh, that's, a, oh, okay, which scholars have you read on this, and where are your disagreements? Now, I don't mean that's snotty. I'm really trying to give the benefit of the doubt and assume the person, my interlocutor, has done the relevant, necessary homework before he's throwing out this inane, silly idea. What I have found is 100% of the time is they've read nothing. They've read nothing. They've barely thought about it at all. But I don't say, I bet you're just a stupid and idiot. You've never read. I mean, that would be unchristian. So I'm going to assume they've read something. I'm going to try to assume that. And then I'll, they go, oh, they'll keep bringing up the issue. I'll pause and say, once again... Who have you read on this? What books have you read? You, or I'll say, have you had any formal training in this? Have you studied any scholarship at all? Who have you read and where are your major disagreements? It, it forces the conversation to be about content, not name calling. It forces it to be about truth and reality. Most people who are non-believers in my experience are usually very rational kind of nerd types like I am. And so when you ask the question about scholarship and content, the, co the conversation come to a screeching halt because they realize you're not just there to call them, oh, you atheists are the same. You don't care about nothing. All you care, you know, you're making about content. Well, if that doesn't happen, if they say, well, I've not read anything at all or they don't know much at all, then it's okay. And I think it's perfectly okay. Then I say, oh, okay. In fact, I said this to one of the atheists. I said, I also would be an unbeliever if I were as ignorant about the scholarship as you are. 
I meant that. I would also be a non-believer. That is, if I didn't know anything about the scholarship, I'm with you. I would just go by what is on Wikipedia and a couple blogs and whatever. I wouldn't probably, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know the difference. Like who gives a rip, but I'm not ignorant of the scholarship. Now, just because scholars argue something doesn't mean therefore it's true. It means I've done the homework and come to my own conclusions, but you're going to find that all the time, if you really try to get in conversation with people who are more hardcore, rigorous, skeptics, atheists, agnostics, they will typically come across very confident, even though they're very wrong. So, again, my first tip is you're, I mean, I'm going to go all my tips here once more. You're just kind, you listen, and so forth, but you take seriously whether they've read anything whatsoever. Another atheist that I was dialoguing on the Twitter, I asked him who is he read on this subject, and he gave me three books that he's read, which I, which is, it's never happened before in the history of me asking. Uh, well, except this one guy, and I'll, that's a different guy, a different, and that's a cool story too, but he said, um, the first was F.F. F. Bruce, the New Testament documents, are they reliable? And that's a good one. Now it's a little, it's dated. I think he wrote that back in the seventies or eighties. It's a real short book, but it's a good one. F.F. F. Bruce was generally considered one of the finest scholars of our last generation. Uh, he just, he was outstanding, outstanding. But the new uh, FF Bruce, the New Testament documents, are they reliable? And then he read two others, and I and I just had a feeling what they were. The first was Carrier, Richard Carrier, has I think a PhD in history, and I've talked about him before. He's convinced Jesus never existed. He's he's convinced it's possibly existed. He thinks that that the early Christians, all of them, the ones that claim to have seen Jesus, saw a vision of an angel, called Jesus, and then they thought that Jesus came around on Earth. But there was no actual historical Jesus, or they would say it's probably never existed. Now, in mainstream scholar, not mainstream, in any kind of historical scholarship, New Testament or otherwise, around the globe, that's a laughing joke. No person in the world will think that except Richard Carrier. So atheists, non-believers love Richard Carrier because he has a PhD and he makes what seems like a, a good argument. Larry Hurtado, a little footnote, Larry Hurtado, the guy I just mentioned earlier, he has a blog, he has a few blog posts. If you search up Larry Hurtado and search up Richard Carey, he did a lot of blog responses to Carrier's uh, work, and he pulled no punches, but he demonstrated how why it's nonsense. Well, he mentioned Carrier, and the third person he mentioned, of course, of course, of course, of course, was Bart Ehrman. The Bart Ehrman, who used to be a New Testament scholar and then deconverted and so forth. So I wrote back and said, Carrier, question mark, oh my lord. Bart Ehrman, okay, but his popular level literature isn't taken very ser- isn't taken seriously by scholars because it's so overly tendentious. Meaning his popular level work, it's to make money. I mean, he sells books, it's fantastical and all that. But in scholarship, he would never write things like he would not always come to the conclusion that he does. Let me say it that way. So that was it. And I talked about. It. I said, well, I hear I can give you some other resources. But and I've said this in other podcasts. I wrote it in my book as well. What you're going to find is if people have read, they have never, 99% of the time, they've not read at all by people in the field. That's because they're not specialists in the field. They didn't even get an undergraduate in the field. They don't know any of the relevant scholars. They read for bias. Now, Christians can do the same thing. Uh, how many Christians out there have never read ever any work ever by an atheist? They've only read Christian literature. So it can work in any world religion, uh, any worldview. What I'm saying is atheists are no different. You're hard pressed to find any of them to find it right. Read anybody that disagrees with their view already, and they come out and go, "Oh, that makes more sense to me." And there's only one atheist I've ever talked to who deliberately I've, I've talked about in other podcasts. He went for a full year and only read Christian literature, and he read the big dogs, Plantinga, Craig, and a bunch of other philosophers. And uh, he didn't read biblicists much at all. He only read really philosophers. And I wish he had read the historians, not just philosophers as well. Um, but I informed him a lot of the historical part. And when I did, he said that was the best part of all Christian arguments, in his opinion, was the historical part. In any case, you'll see in the Twitter, you'll see in YouTube, whatever, people are very confident, and yet they're very, very uninformed. So it's okay for you to do what Larry Hurtado did and does all the time, which is to say, thank you so much, I appreciate you, and I do this all the time on Twitter. I appreciate your input, or I say, I appreciate your opinion. I don't find that persuasive whatsoever. Uh, I'd rather follow all the scholarship on this issue, issue. Thank you so much. Now, this is, that's not the only thing I say. I have a conversation. I'm only talking about this one issue. And so it's okay to say, no, that's enough. Um, I've had conversations with people, and they want me to keep saying this, 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 this. And I go, no, I wrote a whole book on that subject. If you're really interested, go read this book or someone else's book or read a chapter in a book. Uh, that's never happened. 
I've had that one eight, the one atheist who read Christian literature, only Christian literature for a year. He read my book, <laughs> and I didn't. Ask, I don't think I even asked him to. I think he just found out I wrote a book and went and read it. The the, the book the, I'm talking about specifically my book, A Skeptic Challenge as a Christian. So all that to say, uh, don't be swayed by confidence. Uh, be open to content, not confidence. And if you're listening carefully, you'll listen to the person's content and not just their confidence. And then it's okay to say what literature I've read, I've read on that. Well, David, I'm a Christian. I'm not a scholar. I'm not going to get my degrees. I don't know who these scholars are either. My response to you is, okay, but also means you shouldn't be swayed to disbelieve. You should never be swayed to disbelieve if you don't know the scholarship. You can't find a confident atheist and they go, no, uh, I've, I've read two books, a guy named Armin and, Car- uh, Ermin, Ermin and Carrie or whatever, and they're convinced Jesus probably didn't exist. You believe in something stupid and you go, oh my goodness, my faith is a lie. Well, don't do that. Good heavens, don't do that. I mean, don't do not do that. <laughs> There's too many free books. Go to the library. There's too much out there or other blogs, better blogs, uh, podcasts than mine and blogs. On and on and on it goes. But all that to say, my quick reflection there, go do you likewise <laughs> if you want to. And I hope uh, that you will also gain confidence, not arrogance, but confidence in your ability to have content to your faith. And that takes practice. It takes time, but you can get it. You can, you can. God bless. Well, the conversation isn't finished. You can always reach out to me on social media. Are you on Facebook? I am too. At Glimpse of the Kingdom. Glimpse of the Kingdom on Facebook. Be sure to like it and you can see updates there. Also, if you're on Twitter, check me out at at Dr. D. Pendergrass. At Dr. D. Pendergrass. Or at Glimpse the King. At Glimpse the King. And I try my best to respond to comments and questions on there as quickly as I can. If you want more, there are many more resources on the podcast and my blog. Go to my website, davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com, and you can see a full list of the podcast, and my blog is available for free. Are you active in a church right now? I'd be happy to come out to your church and do all kinds of classes and workshops there. Check out davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com for more information. And may God in his great grace give you even just a glimpse of his kingdom this week. See you next time.